Robin Hood Radio welcomes you to David Freeman's Science Insider with your host, the senior science editor of the Huffington Post, David Freeman. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, did you recognize that music? Uh, it might not be the best rendition of uh, the William Tell Overture that you've ever heard, but you might be a bit more impressed if I told you that the instrument used to play it was an automobile. And here to tell us about that uh, is the man who played the car uh, over the rumble strips that made the noise and the music, and that's Professor Trevor Cox. He's a professor of acoustic engineering at the University of Salford in England and the author of a fascinating new book called The Sound Book, uh, The Science of the Sonic Wonders of the World. So welcome, Trevor. Yeah, welcome indeed. Thank you. So tell us about that piece of music, how it, got, how it was played. Yeah, you, you find this piece of road, it's just outside Lancaster in California, and uh, they've cut grooves into the road. And every time you go across a, a set of grooves, you get a buzzing sound. And you may have heard this from a rumble strip down the side of a highway. But what they've done on this particular road is they've spaced the grooves out at different spacings. So when the grooves are spaced far apart, you get a low frequency note. When they're placed, spaced close together, you get a high frequency note. And they put these different patches along the highway, drive along it, and you get a very bad rendition of uh, the theme <laughs> from the Lone Ranger. Right, exactly. But most people know about that. So... You know, your book, as its title, is all about these uh, incredible sonic wonders of the world. You've kind of traveled the world finding them. And uh, as I was reading the book, I was thinking of you as sort of a, a big game hunter going around and trying to bag not a rhino or an elephant, but some incredible sound. Uh, you're a bit of also an evangelist, I think, for sound, the kind of the marvels of sound. And I certainly want to, to share you to share with us some of these uh, favorite sounds. We have some sound samples to share. But... Um, I do want to go back to, um, uh, you know, talk a bit about, about um, the science of sound. So let's start with some basic questions. For example, what is sound? Well, that's a funny question because there isn't one definitive answer. I guess if I opened a dictionary up, uh, it would talk about, you know, whether there's, you know, vibrating air molecules, I guess. Um, but for a lot of people, sound has to involve someone or some thing actually hearing it. So you get these this debate, isn't it, whether tr if does a tree fall in a forest, do you hear a sound? It depends if you're a physicist, because, mm. you know, the, the tree certainly moves air molecules and there's vibration. But for some people, you need to have someone sensing it for that to be sound. So there's no definitive answer to that old uh, that old cliche. And so why? I mean, I, I think sounds for you anyway, sound seems to be very special, but it certainly sound is very uh powerful at triggering emotions, what makes sound so different from, uh, or, or hearing rather, I should say, from our other senses? Well, it has this amazing ability to tap into our emotions. I think particularly if we think of music, I mean, there's not many, you know, other senses that can cause those, you know, the shivers down the back of your spine, which happens when you hear a particular piece of music or, or you, you know, think of a music, if you hear that, that, that tune that was, you, you know, our tune as a couple or a very sad tune, it, it, some of the sounds have an amazing ability to tweak our emotions and, and really it involves a large amount of our brain. It's, it's quite a powerful signal. Uh, and I think the thing about sound as well is it's quite pervasive. You know, if you if you don't like looking at something, you can always look away. But if, if there's a horrible sound around, you don't have earlids to sort of shut it out. So mm. you're forced to listen to it. Right. Well, it'd be good to have those sometimes. I mean, I, you know, I, I know that in my own case, um, certain pieces of music do move me. And as everyone I know, also for me personally, I don't know why, but the sound of a big gong, uh, an incredibly reverberant gong is very moving to me. Does that make any sense to you? Well, I I can't think of an immediate reason why it might be. Maybe there's something happened in your past. Because I mean, people ask ask me about why do we react in certain ways to sounds, and some of them you can think of universal truths. So if I was to make a loud bang behind you, you'd immediately think there's a, something dangerous, and you go into a flight or fight mode, and you, you'd immediately prepare for danger in case you have to fight something off. But some of our responses to sound are, are kind of just based on our experiences. So if I hear seagulls cry, it's not a particularly nice sound, but it gives me a nice conjures up a nice image of being on holiday and, and the seaside when I was a child so you can get these associations that you can you can build up which have nothing really to do with the intrinsic nature of the sound but just how we associate them in our memory so did you hear a gong when you were younger 
Well, I, I don't know, but I, I don't know why. But there, I think there are some some songs that seem to be almost universally, or pieces of music that are almost universally evocative of, of strong emotions. Is that true? I mean, yes, you're, I think, you're, you're a musician as well as, a, as an engineer, so. Yeah, I'm an amateur musician. I play the saxophone. Yeah, there, I mean, there was certainly, you know, this is a very strong reaction called, you know, where the, the hair stand up on the back of the, your head and you get the goosebumps and you get the shivers. There are pieces of music which d do it fairly universally, but then there are ones which are very individual to people. So, you know, it, we, we know that there are some tunes which are more likely to trigger the shivers, but it's not universal. We can have our own individual emotional responses. Are there certain pieces of music that really move you that that are that our listeners might be familiar with? I mean, oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, oh, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I, I guess um, one would be something like a, a grand symphony, like uh, one of Tchaikovsky's symphonies. Um, his his pathetic, you know, the last the last um, uh, the last movement leaves you feeling pretty distraught at the end, but it's quite a grand piece. So that would be one I might pick. So you're mentioning you know orchestral pieces, and I know that one of some of the uh, among the places you visited were concert halls and cathedrals. And are, why is it so hard for these concert halls to get the acoustics right? I mean, we talk about some, I'm sorry, excuse me. You, I mean, some some of these you, you, they're very famous, well-known concert halls, and you visited there, and the acoustics are not great. I'm just wondering why that is. Well, some of it is because they've been built in the past and uh, for various reasons that, that a better one's never been built. I mean, London's quite interesting as a city because it doesn't have, in, in very large concert halls, it doesn't have a tremendous acoustic in any of them. I mean, you know, some are better than others. Um, but there are, certainly are great halls. I, I'm, I'm, the, the hall that I visited, I remember in, in America, was I visited Boston Symphony Hall, which is a very old hall, but it's still ranked up in the you know top three concert halls in the world when they do surveys um so you know i think nowadays with modern techniques modern design techniques you can pretty much guarantee a new concert hall won't be a disaster um, but whether you achieve excellence is still slightly down to luck well and a lot of it is my understanding of this from reading your book is that it's the reverberations within the hall and the echoes that happen so why is reverberation so important for for making music as moving as it can be or as engaging I don't actually think we know why reverberation is is so is so beautiful, but it certainly is. And, and you know, you you listen to a, a pop record, you'll find that the vocals on that almost certainly have reverberation added to it to make the singer sound better. Or if you go into a, you know, if you go to an outdoor concert where a, an orchestra's playing in a field, you know, with loudspeakers, it always sounds a bit thin and remote. So adding reverberance, which you get in a classical orchestra when you go into a concert hall, it gives you a sense of the, the sound sort of surrounding you and you being more involved in the sound. And it, it's less, the sound doesn't sound so distant. So it gives a sense of being involved in the music, which may be why we like it. But it's also reverberation is really useful to the musicians. It makes it much easier to make music. For one thing, the music's louder because you get the supporting reverberation. And the other thing is it helps musicians to hear each other and to play in time and things like that. So maybe we like reverberation just because musicians find it easier to make better music when they can hear themselves a bit. Right. Another way that we uh, experience reverberation is not just in, in concert halls, but also when we're outdoors and we, we create an echo. I think you're, that's a particular interest of yours as well. And in the book, you describe the story of making an attempt to create the world's longest echo. I believe I've got that right. Let's listen to that for a second. Wow. Uh, can you tell us about uh, where and when that re was recorded? Yeah, it's recorded in quite an amazing place. It's actually in an oil storage depot up in Scotland, almost the top of Scotland. And it was built uh, just before the Second World War and finished at the early days of the Second World War. And it was it was built to protect the Royal Navy shipping oil from German bombing. So actually, these are giant concrete chambers that are buried into the side of a Scottish hill. And when you walk up to it, you wouldn't know they were there apart from these big metal doors. And inside, they're vast spaces. I mean, the size of a small cathedral, uh, big arch concrete spaces, uh, you know, they're uh, about the length of a couple of uh, football uh, pitches. So they're, they're vast spaces. And when you first go into that space, uh, it's completely dark, apart from the torch you bring in, because there's no, there's no power in the place. Uh, and so you have no sense of the space. But as soon as you make any noise, you hear this great big boom coming out. 
And if I was to take along something like a, I don't know, a, a trombone or something and play a sound in there, the sound would last, oh, maybe a couple of minutes before it would die away. So the sound echoes around for a huge long time. And, and why, why doesn't it keep going on forever? I mean, what, what, what causes it to, to diminish? Well, it, there's two things stopping the sound going on forever. That in most rooms, what stops sound going on is is every time the sound bounces off a wall, it a little bit gets absorbed. Uh, so you get the absorption of the walls. Uh, you know, the walls literally vibrate of your house. You know, if, if you're listening to a noisy neighbour and you're hearing the sound coming through, that's the vibrations of the walls you're listening to. Um, but in that oil tank, the the walls are so thick, they're about half a metre thick concrete, and they're actually, you know, stuck on the bedrock of Scotland, that the walls don't do a lot of vibration. So the, the, the absorption of the walls in that oil tank are incredibly low. And the other, the other thing which causes the sound to eventually die away is what's called, we would call air absorption. Normally, it's not important, but in such a large space it is. As the air molecules vibrate and pass the sound wave around the room, they just lose a very, very tiny amount of energy in that vibration. And it's not normally important in a, in a space, but with a space which is, you know, a quarter of a kilometre long, it becomes rather important. So at high frequency, what you're listening to is air absorption. Right. And among the other, that's fascinating, among uh, some of the other sonic wonders um, uh, you talk about, there were some in, in Europe, uh, there were in the, to, uh, the Mojave Desert and, and back closer to home on the East Coast. So when you travels around the world outside of the, the US and, and Europe, uh, what, were, what were some of the most amazing sounds that you heard in, in putting this book together? Well, I, I remember sounds from Australia. I remember particularly one which was uh, just by luck. I was on a family holiday. I landed on a beach and started walking. It was Whitehaven Beach. And uh, suddenly I noticed the sand was squeaking as I walked on it. And you get, you get these beaches around the world where, where the sands are just the right. And, and as you walk, you get the squeaking effect. And in fact, Australia are very good at naming their beaches. They actually have a beach which is called Squeaky Beach. <laughs> and uh, sand, it's quite amazing phenomena. There's only one place in Britain which does that. Um, but if you go to find the same kind of sand, but you find it in a very dry place in a, in a desert, you can hear it booming. And that's what I met in the Mojave Desert. So that's where you're up on a big dune. This is the Kelso Dunes is the one I went on to. And when you create an avalanche by sitting on your backside and sliding down, you create an avalanche, you get this great big droning sound, which sounds mm. like a taxiing aircraft. It's a very loud sound. And it's, uh, you know, it's been, there's not many sites to do that. It's about 40 documented sites around the world where you get that droning. So what it can explain, what's, what's happening that these tiny grains in sand can make such a loud sound? Yeah, for both the squeaky beach and the droning sound, you, you need all the sand grains to be roughly the same size. And so something's happening in the Mojave Desert, something's happening in the way the sand is being picked up by the winds and being sifted in size by the eddy currents to mean that the sand grains are all roughly the same size. They also have to have the right coating so that when they sand grains sl slide past each other, they have just the right friction to create the sound. But they all basically all have to move in a synchronous way. And that's the reason they all have to be the same size. So whole layers move together to create almost like a giant loudspeaker with the sand grains moving up and down as they go down the uh, down the slope and that doesn't normally happen on a normal dune because the grains are all different sizes they don't have this varnish and often they're wet as well which stops them sliding mm. so what about uh, elsewhere in the u.s i mean our listeners are in, in new england and you mentioned symphony hall in boston are there any other sonic wonders closer to home for us yeah, I think a couple on the East Coast. There's a, there's a great whispering arch in Grand Central downstairs. So we have in Britain, we have a, a whispering gallery in St. Paul's Cathedral. So you go up into the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, which have these big curved walls. And you can whisper into those walls and the sound will hug the inside of the wall, which allows you to have a conversation with your friend who's way across the other side of the dome. And you get this with any curved surface. And in fact, in Grand Central down, downstairs, there's these, these brick archways, well, the tiled archways. And you can whisper into those tiled archways and the, and the wall, the sound will stick to the inside of the arch and go to the other side. So that's quite well known, the whispering arch at Grand Central Station. Um, moving well, up near... question, let me ask you one other question about that, because, yeah, I, I've, I've experienced that. It is an incredible phenomenon. But why is it that you talk about the sound waves kind of sticking or hugging to that wall? I, why does that happen? Why don't they just bounce off and go off, be dispersed into the room? Why do they kind of follow the contour? Yeah, it's if you imagine uh, 
getting a pool table instead of it being square you made a round pool table it'd be kind of odd odd thing to play on but you could play on it if you put your your cue ball and and just cue the ball off at an angle along the edge of the curve you'll find the cue ball never goes into the middle of the cue uh, of the pool table just the angles it bounces off will keep it around the edge so it's kind of you can work it out just using a protractor and working out the angles that you know a simple ball will bounce off around a round table you can and it's just it's a quirk of geometry but if you were to, does that suggest that when you do it, I can't remember from my own experience, but if I were to talk straight into the wall, directly on the wall, that would be less effective than if I tilted my head up and spoke as if to, to give a contour? Because if you shot a cue, a cue ball 90 degree angle into the, into the bank, it's not going to go around the table. Yeah, no, um, it, it's best to whisper along the wall. But to be honest, if you whisper even straight at the wall, some of the sound will go upwards. So you'll still get this whispering gallery effect going on. So, yeah, when you go to St. Paul's Cathedral, they tell you to whisper into the wall. Well, actually, you're better whispering along the wall. But even into the wall, some of the sound leaks out the side and goes around. And, and I'm sorry I interrupted you. We're going to talk about another wonder. I'm thinking of a couple myself, but maybe you'll mention it. Well, there's one up in Boston. There is the Maparium, which is quite amazing. For so, so those who don't know, it's in it's in a, a library, and it's a globe of the world, which you can go inside. So it's quite large, uh, and it was built back in the 1930s. And and anything which is spherical has the most peculiar acoustics uh, inside. And there's a variety of phenomena. In fact, it, it, it's a whispering gallery. You can go and whisper and curve the sound around the walls if you want. But you can also stand in the middle and get all sorts of weird effects where the sound seems to be coming from the wrong direction. And it's all because when you talk in a, a surface with, with this curved surface, you get a very strong focusing effect. It's like when you look into a, a shaving mirror and you see the, you know, the, 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 the magnification effect of the, of the curve of the, of the uh, shaving mirror. You get a magnification effect of the sound from the curvature of the walls and you can do things like if you stand in the middle and lean slightly to the left you can whisper into your right ear which is kind of peculiar using the reflections of the uh, of the walls to focus the sound on your right ear well i think you talk about in your book about how you can fool people you can say hey this way and, and they look to your voice and actually you're coming you're on the opposite side from which the sound is coming yeah, I, I, I met a, and funnily enough, in London, I met a guide who used to work in that, that library who happened to be an audio engineer who went along to one of my talks. And he told me as a guide, he used to have a lot of fun uh, t- telling people over here and they would look the wrong direction. So, yeah, I, I, I haven't been to, the, uh, to that particular library, but I've been to another one, a spherical room in, in Berlin, and it has all these w- very weird effects. And w- one other thing, too, which actually is, is not quite close to home, but is the... Uh... Uh, is the horn, I guess you'd call it, that's driven by the tides. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, there's uh, there's not many examples of sound art which are which are permanently around, but there are three which are actually uh, tidal organs. There's one in San Francisco, uh, and there's one in Croatia, and there's one actually rather near me in northern England in Blackpool. So uh, uh, they, what they've got in them is essentially uh, church organ pipes. And with church organ pipes, what you have is big air pumps pumping air through the pipe work uh, and you these uh, sea organs similarly have air going through the pipes to give the sound but how the air is moved is by compressing it by waterways pushing air up them so you have what you if you look in the blackpool one you can see the pipes going down to the sea and as the waves wash up the pipe they push air up the pipe and into these uh, organ pipes and they create sounds and they the sound is kind of depends on the sea so if you go along when the sea is quite calm you get sort of very slow, gradual music doesn't seem to do very much. It sort of kind of seems to the notes almost moan at you. And then if the sea gets quite choppy, it's almost like a very fast piece of kind of modern sort of uh, avant-garde classical music. Right. Uh, and uh, let's listen to that for a minute. <laughs>
And actually, do you have? Uh, I'm stopping, pausing here. So I think you do have that on your site, don't you? Yeah, if you go, you find the Blackpool one. I don't have the other two, but you'll find the Blackpool one on there. Oh, right. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I thought. So, okay, so Tales so of the Blackpool. This this thing will go in, and, and I, I'll help with this afterwards. So, um, okay, this is going good. And Trevor, how, I mean Taylor, how much time do we have left? Uh, well, you're at. You're at almost 19 minutes now, but I'm not sure how long those little sound clips are that you're going to be playing. Well, they're probably only about you know 20 seconds, something like that. I'm okay. guessing. So yeah, they're all brief. They're not very long. Okay, then you right. you have about 10 minutes left. Okay, uh, and I have a couple more, and I'm going to include include the Larray uh, thing also. But is there anything else that? Because I want to ask you about kind of Trevor. Two more thematic, two more things. One is kind of like how to appreciate sounds more in our own lives, because you're kind of an evangelist as well. And then then about the Larray. Uh, is there anything else that you think would be interesting to people that you want to talk about? No, I think those two would be quite good. If you want more, we can go, let's do those two and see how much time we've done. And then well, is there? Well, I think we probably need a little bit more. So I'm trying to think of uh, what else I wanted to ask you. I had a whole series of questions here. Um, well, anyway, well, we can talk a bit more about. I want to talk about the experience of kind of being immersed in the world of sound uh, and how people might be better at appreciating sound. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll start up again. Um, okay, uh, three, two, one. Wow, that's that's pretty. That's kind of a weird sound. Um, a sound that one of my favorite sounds. I think my, the favorite sound uh, that that um, you talk about in your book is that of what's called the great stalactite organ. So let's hear that for a minute, and then uh, Trevor, maybe you can tell us a bit about uh, about that. Okay, so they want to start the stalactite organ. And so I will and I ask you here, um, wow, it's hard to believe, so we'll start here, okay. Wow, so that's it, hard to believe those are actually sounds being made by uh, rock. So tell us about that, Trevor. Yeah, it's in Lure Caverns in Virginia, and it's the most amazing show cave. It's, uh, I don't think I've seen so many cave formations stuffed into one space in all my life. And in the in the last cavern you go into, there, there's what looks like, well, it is, it's just a, an organ keyboard, as you would see in a church. But when you press a key, instead of playing pipes, what happens is a little rubber hammer taps a stalactite and creates a note. And there's 37 keys linked up to 37 stalactites to allow you to play 37 different notes. So it seems kind of incredible that stones should ring, but you do get, you know, these are called lithophones. You do get stones. If they're made in just the right structure, they will actually create a nice ringing sound. And uh, it was it was made back in the 1950s uh, by an engineer called Leland Sprinkle, who he went to the cave and saw a demonstration of just someone hitting one of the stalactites with a rubber hammer. And he thought, well, I'll make a whole organ. And it took him three years working with a, a tuning fork and an angle grinder and various other things to make uh, and uh, lots of wiring, electromagnetic stuff to make up this uh, great stalic pipe organ. So he did have to tune the rocks in a sense. He had to shave them away, grind them away to make the right notes. Yeah, yeah, he first of all had to find rocks which rang nicely. So mostly when you hit a rock, they go thud and they're a bit disappointing. So he had to find the stalactites which rang beautifully. And then he had to get them in tune. And I don't think he'd be allowed to do this nowadays, but he took an angle grinder out and made this, you know, the tuning for a particular rock is determined by not only the material properties, but how big it is. So mm. if you've got a rock which is a bit flat and you grind the end off it, it will go sharper and sharper. And so that's how he tuned his instruments. But I don't think he'd be allowed to do it now. I think it would probably be seen as a, not a thing to do to a to a cave formations which are maybe tens of thousands of years old. Yeah, desecration, but a beautiful desecration, I guess. So and that and you mentioned the term uh, lithophone, and I know that there's the idea of I guess literally that's what rock sound or. Uh, uh, and, and there have been other lithophones uh, around the world, and I know that there's been some talk that Stonehenge, uh, although it's been modified, originally was built uh, as sort of an acoustic cathedral of sorts. Is that a current theory at this point, or, or no? Yeah, I think one of the things I, I try and bring out in the book is, is when one of the reasons we should think about sound is, is we should think about them when we go and see prehistoric sites. So I think traditionally, when you go to the grand, grand sites like Stonehenge, it's very easy to look and take pictures and think these rocks must have been very difficult to bring here but our, our ancestors would have found the acoustics to be fascinating and it's important these prehistoric sites that we we don't just look through our sort of visual centric 21st century eyes but think about what our prehistoric ancestors would have thought about the sound in there so there's, there's people who are doing what's called archaeoacoustics trying to work out what the acoustics of the past are and it's quite difficult because 
you know the sounds have disappeared so what you have to look at is as, as some of the sort of evidence is actually you know ancient artifacts so we have found prehistoric lithophones you know there are there is a cave in france where there's evidence by the sort of uh, percussion marks that a, a stalactite has been played and since the cave got sealed up thousands of years ago uh, they can actually see from the calcite growing on the outside of these percussion marks how old this was mm. and it was used in prehistoric times so stonehenge itself um it, it has uh it's a closed stone circle which would have meant it, it has an acoustic which to us in in modern ears probably doesn't sound that unusual because we're used to being in a room we're used to hearing echoing sound around a room but prehistoric ancestors would have been much more unusual there would have been very few man-made structures with that acoustic there would have been some caves around but mostly there would have been a very unusual acoustic right and like and they didn't have sound. They didn't have, uh, you know, iPods and such to listen to music. So uh, they had live music, of course, but there were probably much limited, much more limited sense of, uh, you know, music around. Yeah, I, 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 we, we do know music making. We can date, you know, the oldest musical instruments which have been found so far are tens of thousands of years old. So, that, you know, they have found, you know, vulture bones made into flutes so we can we can assume with stonehenge which is newer than that there would have been music of some form exactly what form we don't know i mean it's a ritual site so we can assume that rituals probably involved some some sound because it, it does in the modern world we usually chant or we sing or we talk or we you know play musical instruments so it seems obvious that in stonehenge there would have been music of some form and speech of some form, even though we don't know exactly what it was used for. And the acoustics would have been kind of handy. The acoustics would have enhanced the sound, you know, that reverberance, which we find, you know, we add to our pop music because it makes it sound better. Well, you get a reverberance in the enclosed stone circle, which would have enhanced any music or speech going on in the space. The, the great argument, which is impossible to resolve, is whether any of that acoustic quality was, was you know, up, up in the mind when they built it. And uh, right. there are people who make those arguments that these places had some acoustic design in them. But I think it's more likely in my mind that, that the acoustics was a byproduct of them making it. But that certainly would have exploited the, the acoustics once they turned up. Well, we, we have only about um, a minute or so left. But I wanted to cover last, one last topic with you, which is this, that, as I said initially, you're as well as kind of being a, a big game hunter of these, uh, maybe a miss an unfortunate metaphor, but that's what occurred to me, the game hunter looking for these uh, sonic wonders. You're also a bit of an evangelist. And I was, as I was reading your book and I was walking around uh, town, I was trying to uh, pay more attention to the sounds and try to um, appreciate some of the sounds in a way that I'm not usually conscious of doing. But I found it very difficult. It was for me like trying to meditate. I would listen to the sounds of voices or the sounds of uh, bird song, and then within a minute or two, I was lost in my thoughts. <laughs> And I wonder, do you have any, as someone who's been immersed in this world and thought a lot about it, what advice do you have for people about how to kind of get the most out of the, the sound that's in their lives? Yeah, I, th I think uh, I went to some extremes to try and, uh, you know, tune my hearing. I went to silent retreats and all sorts of kind of things. But I actually think for most people, it's a really simple process is just to spend a bit of time listening. I th we already have really sophisticated hearing you know listening to music or having a conversation involves a vast amount of our brain so we don't need a better brain to do listening we just need to want to pay attention to the sounds around us so it's a kind of a conscious decision that we're not going to block the sound out we're not going to plug our mp3 players in we're not going to contemplate what we're going to cook for tea tonight or what's on the shopping list and we're just going to listen to what's out there and it's a bit you know, people like to sit in cafes and watch people go past and people watch and people like sit listening into gossip. It's a bit like that. You just some of the time you just listen out for what you can hear and you don't spend very long over it. But it, and, and there's pleasure to be had. I mean, at the moment in England, I mean, the birds have just come out because it's spring. So that's beautiful. And if I go into my back garden, I can hear frogs because they're all mating in the ponds. You know, it's little things like that, which just sort of, kind of are uplifting. Right. Well, I'm going to try to be uh, more... Uh, to pay more attention, closer attention to the sound around me and try to block out the sounds that I don't like and try to hear the ones that, that, that do please me. And I hope everyone will do the same. Uh, it's a really fascinating book. And thanks so much for being here uh, with us, uh, Dr. Trevor Cox, uh, Professor Trevor Cox. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Science Insider with David Freeman, the Senior Science Editor of the Huffington Post. Produced in cooperation with Robinhood Radio, robinhoodradio.com on the web.